All right. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we continue to preach through the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know how many sermons I have preached already on the Sermon on the Mount. Many, many, many. Probably more than 30 already. And we haven't even got through the fifth chapter yet. <laughs> and there's six and seven as well. But uh, we know the Lord will bless as we go through this. I know that I'm not going to preach all of this sermon today as well. Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that, whatsoever, that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already, in thy heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not the whole body should be cast into hell. That is the end of, that's all the verses I wanted, because that's all about adultery. The next thing we're talking about is marriage. We'll talk about marriage in a couple weeks. I notice none of you have come to church this morning maimed. So none of your eyes have ever offended you, and your hand has never offended you, so you've never cut it off. You haven't taken any scriptures quite literally, have you? Well, <laughs> good. We'll get into that here later. Let's pray. Father... As we begin this study this morning, I ask that you'd bless us. It's not a popular subject to talk about sin, but you talk about sin consistently through thy word. And you say that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and certainly we have. And that the wages of such sin is death. And Father, we know that you also forgive the sins of thy people. And for this we are so grateful, so thankful. And as we look into this, this term, uh, this dealing with adultery, uh, Father, I hope that you'll, uh, I, I pray that you will help me to teach this according to thy word. That we will see that it, that it goes way beyond just adultery. We have so many areas of weakness in our flesh. So many things that need to be brought under the submissive, uh, be, where we need to be submissive to Thee and the containment of our lust, that we might be uh, able to serve Thee in the Spirit of Christ. Father, help me to preach this morning on this uh, subject for which not a one of us are not guilty of. You'd bless us and strengthen us. Amen. We come to the second exposition that Christ has given to his church. The first one we saw uh, where he said, Thou shalt not kill. Murder. And we saw that murder was much more than the slain of an individual, the illegal slain of another individual. We saw it was much, much broader than that. And so it is with this verse, thou shalt not commit adultery. It is much bigger than just the subject of adultery. And we'll see that as we go on. And as we look at the second of six expositions which Christ gives to his church, and the faults, and we're going to also look at the faults and twisted teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees of the law of Moses. The real impact of the law of Moses had been overlooked and ignored by the scribes and the Pharisees. They did not give them the import that justly belongs to that law. Jesus did not just repeat what Moses had written, but he rather focused on the real impact of the law in regard to man and the absolute holiness and righteousness of God in that law. 
The law manifested the righteousness of God, not the righteousness of man. Rather, it manifested the absolute depravity of man and the inability of man in any way to keep that law. Now, let's please note with me the Pharisees, or the phrase, but I say unto you, notice there in our text, he says, thou shalt not commit adultery, or I, I should say, you have heard in old times that it was said, or you have heard that it was said by them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, here we have the lawgiver himself expounding the, minute, the, the meaning of the law. It is Christ that gave the law to Moses. And then Moses expounded that law to the people. And the and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees were also supposed to expound the law of Moses, but only, but they did not actually expound the law of Moses. You see, the scriptures say in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, or 1 2 says, Hath in these last days, God is, in verse 1 says, God had in sundry times and in, in diverse matters, or in the times past and in all sorts of matters, has spoken by or through the prophets. But hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, whom he made, uh, by whom he made the world. You see, it is the words of Christ. It is God the Son that has spoken to us in these last days, and we ought to give heed to what he has spoken. And when did he start speaking? Well, you start in Matthew. You see, people, there's a, there's, there's a lot of Christendom, let's put it that way, do not want to heed the words of the Savior. They do not want to hear the words of Christ. They do not heed the word of God. Oh, how I wish I personally had the reverence for God's word that this word demands. There isn't a man on this earth that references this word the way he ought to. You and I will never come to a full understanding of this book. There's no such thing as mastering this book, the word of God. You cannot master it. It is the word of God, and it is eternal. It is written in the heavens, and we can never, ever learn all that needs to be learned by it. We have no ability to comprehend all that is written, the depth of what is written. We might comprehend some words, we'll under, or the words, I hope we comprehend the words. We can look up every single word in the dictionary, can't we? We sure can. We can comprehend the words, but the depth of their meaning, how deep they go, we often cannot get to the, well, we can't get to the bottom of that well. One thing we should always do, we should always practice reverencing the Word of God. Believing what it says. What was the error of the children of Israel? They did not believe God. You'll see where they, over and over and over again, the reason why God brought judgment upon Israel is because they did not believe Him. They just didn't believe him. You know, how many times do people not believe us? And who are we? <laughs> what are our opinions worth? We think very highly of our opinions a lot of times, but the preacher will get up and he'll preach the word of God. But how many people believe what he preaches? Well, some things that preachers preach ought not to be believed, right? Well, because it didn't come from God's word, right? We need to reverence this word. It never lies. God's word never lies. It never deceives. It is impeccable because its author is impeccable. The problem is, is that we as men try to change things that are in the word of God to fit some doctrine that we might have. No, our doctrine ought to come from the word of God. 
not us projecting our doctrine upon the Word. It ought to be believed. It ought to be memorized. It ought to be the greatest influence upon our character and occupy our thoughts continually. That's the reason why we're to memorize it. That's the reason why we're to read it and study it and know it is so that it has the greatest uh, influence upon our character as possible. The scripture says that we're to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And you can read and hear all you want, but you know what? We're to be a doer of it. We're to do it. The holy word ought to be prayed. It ought to be sung. It ought to be preached. It is the revealed will of God for us who believe. It is the revealed word of God against those who don't believe as well. It shows us what God's will is. Now we can see from our text this morning that our Lord not only deals with the action but also the heart from which the action is produced. What was the teaching of the Pharisees concerning this uh, adultery? It says, you have heard of old times Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, the Pharisees and the scribes said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. They repeated just exactly what the law says. But that's about as far as they went. The scribes and the Pharisees had reduced this commandment to the act of adultery only. And it was punishable by death according to the law. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes had no power to enact death. They could recommend to the state, that is to Rome, the death of an individual, but they couldn't because they were under subjection of Roman law, could not themselves carry out that law. But according to the law of Moses, adultery was punishable by death. Now the Pharisaical approach to adultery was exemplified by a U.S. president when he said, I did not have sex with that woman. Remember that? He was guilty of a lewd act, but it was not actually the act of adultery. You see how fine that hair is split with the Pharisees? Oh, I didn't actually, I didn't actually commit adultery. The Pharisees do not and did not consider the heart of the man, just the act that he did. This is the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. It was, it was in the keeping of the exact letter of the law and focusing on its merit only. Now the merit to the Pharisee, now this is the thinking of the Pharisee, you've got to think about this. The merit of the Pharisee was in the keeping of pure bloodlines in regard to property and the inheritance of an estate. <coughs> in other words, if a wife in her adultery bears a bastard son, then the Ill illegitimate offspring might inherit that which is not rightfully his. The woman may have bear a son and say, oh, husband, you're the, you're the father of this child. But really the child was a result of an adulterous relationship. The illegitimate son had no right to the inheritance. And this is what the Pharisees were all concerned about. Now we also know, according to the law, that a man could have concubines, but the offspring of these woman, women would not jeopardize the right of the rightful heir or son. But if the son was unknown as to his father's origin, a bastard son, and if that son could, would then be Ill, illegitimate and not have a legal right to the inheritance. And so the Pharisees described, that's why we were so, so narrow on this narrow. That's why, yeah, if, if you're an adulteress or an adulterer, 
then there's this possibility of the, the bloodline and the right of inheritance being destroyed. See, the concern of the Pharisees was not for the sanctity of marriage. How do I know that? He was not interested in the protection of, they were only in, in, interested in the, protective, uh, the protection of the rightful heir. How do I know they didn't care about marriage? Because Jesus deals with marriage in the next, in the next section here. Because they misused marriage and what marriage was about. We know that they didn't care much for marriage because our Lord deals with marriage and divorce in the next of exposition. In Matthew 23, 23 through 28, this is what Jesus says about the Pharisees. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're just filled with hypocrisy. You say one thing, you do another. Ye for ye pay mint, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye have done, and not left the other undone. You see, they were more concerned with the little, tiny little details and getting all them right instead of the broad aspect of what the law was about. They missed the boat on the whole matter of the law. He says, ye blind guides would strain in a gnat and swallow a camel. You're, you're, you're so focused on things that you'll, you'll, I mean, that we have around here, or at least, well, Maybe not here, but up in the woods and around the lakes, they have these, what they call, no see gnats. And they bite. I mean, they, they, they leave a welt on you like a mosquito. But they're, they're so tiny. That's why you call, they're called no see them. <laughs> you just don't see them. I don't, I, I'm sure that's not their, their real name. I'm sure they have a, a name. But we call them no see them because you didn't see them. You didn't see them when they bit you, but you saw them. Saw what happened after they got done biting you. They hurt. They itch. They swell. You see, these they, they, these these men were blind to what the law was all about. They missed the boat entirely. He blind guides with strain at a gnat, but you'll swallow the whole camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you may clean the outside of the cup and the, of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. You, you know, we these last few weeks I've been doing a lot more dishes. <laughs> and I've been doing them by hand, a lot of them. And you know what? It, when you wash your dishes, but you got your dishes stacked up and you put them in the water, you clean out, what's the first thing you do? You clean the inside. And what I always find is a lot of times we I'll put them in the, over in the rinsing part of it and then find out that the backside's all dirty too. But why is the backside dirty? Because it sat inside another dirty dish. I just didn't wash the backside. But these Pharisees washed the outside and didn't care what was on the inside. You see, they were concerned about external matters and not internal matters. And I'll tell you, if you take care of internal matters, the external matters will get taken care of by themselves. They didn't care what was in the heart of man. They only washed the outside, so everything looked good on the outside. Woe unto ye, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because you make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse the, uh, it says, cleanse first which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whitened sepulchres, which indeed appear, appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. For even so also outwardly appear righteous unto man, but within ye are full of hypocrisy. And iniquity. Now, if you go over to the graveyard where my son is, you'll find beautifully manicured lawns or lawn. And there's a headstone where my son is that is beautifully 
engraved. But you dig down into that grave, and what are you going to find? Dead man's bones. He says, you make the outside look really, really nice. You appear to be righteous. You appear all groomed and clean and in perfect order. But on the inside, you're dead. You're rotten. There's nothing in you that is worthy of anything. Dead man's bones. We ought not to be guilty of the sins of the Pharisees and the scribes. We ought not to. We ought not to do that. But, we, but so many people who claim to be Christ's and, and churches do exactly the same as the scribes and the Pharisees. They do that a lot of times by calling things sin that aren't sin. If the Bible doesn't call it a sin, don't you call it a sin. I'm not going to call it a sin if the Bible doesn't call it a sin. Some people will call you, will call you a sinner or that you're sinning, and I'm just going to use this as just one example. It's a, it's a big one out there for, as far as Christian dub is concerned, but drinking wine. You find anywhere in the Bible where it's a sin to drink wine. No. And these preachers that get up and tell you that every place you find wine in the Bible and believers drinking it and where Jesus took it, it was grape juice. Some man wrote a book. Uh, laws, of laws of Fermentation and Biblical Wine or something like that. And all of a sudden, everybody drop, jumps on this bandwagon as, it's a, as it is an authority on the subject. And it is not. The man is inaccurate in some of these things. When wine was used in the Lord's Supper, clean up until Welch's came on the scene. Now, Mr. Welch, wasn't he a dentist? I, I don't know. I think he was. But he was a Methodist. And he wanted to find some way to substitute wine in the Lord's Supper. To some way to design the, wa the, wa the grape juice so it wouldn't ferment. Because it will naturally ferment on the vine. Now people don't think so. These people who, who hold on tenaciously on this, this uh, everything that Jesus did and the way that they, well tell me, how did they, at the Lord's Supper there in Corinth, how did they get drunk if they were drinking grape juice? A lot can be said about that. But, but and I'm not, this sermon is not about biblical wines. Fact is, is it was wine. And, and, and the, in the temple, the best and the oldest, the most mature, the most alcoholically rich wine was used in temple worship. The best wines were used in the worship in the temple. Now, I, you might be called a great sinner if you drink a glass of wine. You, you would be a great sinner if you owned a winery. Yet drinking wine was common in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And being the owner of a vineyard and a wine press was a noble profession in Jesus' day. Today, if you owned a winery, you just try to find a Baptist church that would take you in. We would here. We would have any problem with it. Matter of fact, we'd ask you if he might supply the wine for our supper. Lord's Supper, that is. We should never be influenced by society, tradition, or the rules of men as to what sin is or is not. Society and other churches should not determine for us what the Word of God teaches what sin is. You find dancing forbidden in the Bible? Oh, I don't. But I'll tell you what, as long as you dance the way they did in the Bible, well, I do know. There was dancing that was wicked and evil. 
just go look at the at, at the children of Israel in the desert when when Moses was coming down with the law and they were dancing and worshiping and doing things that were very very wicked that is condemned but David also danced before the Lord it says he danced naked now folks can don't put your head in the gutter the word naked in the scriptures in referring to David's dancing David obeyed the law of God and the exposure of hips and things would have been or of a bare chest would have been considered a sin in the Word of God it just says he basically as he put off his outer coat and was dancing without all of the dressing and regal robes and things that were that he would normally have about him he, he was coming back from war I think and he didn't have on his armor he basically didn't have any of that external stuff on and he danced before the Lord and it wasn't wicked you see the Bible puts the brakes on everything there's no prohibition against drinking wine but there's a prohibition a prohibition against drunkenness Call sin, sin, that is sin. The Bible does not, uh, does enough to convince me that I am a great sinner without some tradition or moral outrage by some church to call a sin, call me a, call something a sin that's not found in the scripture. Now, you can, you, you can make wine drinking a sin. You can. You can do that by not, by forgetting about brotherly love. If you offend a brother by your drinking of wine, you have sinned. Just like Paul said, I won't eat meat if I'm going to offend a brother. Nothing wrong with the meat I'm eating, but if my brother is offended by that meat, I'm not going to eat it. And the same way with you drinking wine. If it offends a brother, then you have, then you have sinned against your brother and you don't, you're showing that you don't love your brother. Or if you're publicly drunk, that's a public offense. And so it is sin to do that and is worthy to be put out of the Lord's church for it. You see, the Word of God defines and confines and tells us what sin is. You want to know what sin is? Read your Bibles. These Pharisees made adultery far less sinful than what the law teaches it to be. Now what is Christ teaching concerning adultery? He says, Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her committeth adultery with her in his heart. Now folks, I know he uses the masculine here, but it's not beyond women to do the same thing towards men. This isn't just only a man problem, it's a man, it's a human problem. Perhaps though we as men have the most difficult time with it because of the manly nature in which we are created with. Now, I don't ex necessarily expect you ladies to understand that, but we men understand that. Men's biggest problem is their eyes. Women have a different problem with this area. But men, you, you, I don't know where, you know, some of these things, there's a lot of directions to go in this sermon. I want to keep on task here. What I, what I do want to do is I want to define what it means to look on a woman to lust after her. First, it is not the casual evil thought which is checked by holy watchfulness. We may catch something in our eye. We may, we may be attracted to something we ought not to be attracted to or to a part of a woman's body that we ought not to be. But we catch ourselves and we turn our head that is not what it's talking about here. Christian men have a difficult this 
in this day and age, particularly to keep pure thoughts. We struggle every day, and when we often turn our head from, from one immodest woman, we turn and we look another way, and there's another immodest woman. Women today dress immodestly, continuously, almost always. We can't go through life with our eyes shut, ladies. We cannot do it. We might as well then pluck out both of our eyes and you lead us. Because everywhere we turn, I'm speaking as men, we see immodestly dressed women. It behooves women to dress Modestly. The eyes of men should not be attracted to the bodies of women, but rather to their face. We're to look upon a woman's beauty in her face, not the rest of her body, so as to lust after her. Now, if ladies insist on wearing clothing, that reveals your curves, you will have men lusting after you. I've heard women complain and say, oh, men are dogs, are staring at them with their tongues hanging out. In fact, have you not seen cartoons years ago where, where you know, dogs with their tongues hanging out at some uh, beautiful girl or something? But what behavior do you expect when you're dangling food in front of the dog. If you dangle a steak out in front of that dog, what do you expect him to do? He will never divert his eyes from that steak and his tongue will be hanging out. He just want to, he wants to go get that thing, doesn't he? How do you think it's any different from a man, ladies? This is serious business. Even a Christian man. Dress as Christian ladies that you're supposed to be, and you will save your brethren from sin. If you love your brother in Christ, you will dress like a Christian with great modesty and concern for your brother. Now, now ladies, I know that there's no one in this church that dresses immodestly. Because I can see you all, and I see you every Sunday, and I know that you dress modestly. And I certainly do appreciate that. If you didn't, I might call you out. <laughs> but there are people who come into this assembly who are not members here. There are people who come in from time to time who are unsaved. There may be people who will view this video Therefore, the message has to get out. It needs to be taught whether we're all modest in this church or not. It needs to be taught. So what is it to look on a woman to lust after her? It is the gazing upon her body with a view to feed your lustful desires. It is the impure beholding of a, wo of a woman in the view of fornication. That's what it means to lust after a woman. The word lust means to desire. And we're going to look at this a little bit more. In James 4, 1, 14 and 50, it says, But every man is tempted. And this just, just doesn't apply to this, but to any form of lust. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I like to fish. I really do. And guess what this verse reminds me of? Fishing. Because to, it says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When I, when I run that worm 
I remember when I was a boy, go down the creek. We, we have cricks here. I don't, we don't have creeks. We have cricks. And, uh, and across, there was a big log jam on the other side of this culvert. Huge log jam. Been there for years and years and years. And there was this old log on the, on the other side, off of the bank, down into the creek. And the way the water came out and, swam, and, and then brushed up underneath that log and then came back out, there was always a fish in there. Always a fish in there. I knew there was always a fish in there. But laying that worm in there just right, flipping it in there, and getting the current to, to take it under and bring it around, that, that was kind of an art. I had to learn how to do that. And I'd hook me a fish every time. But if it wouldn't take a worm, I'd have to tempt that fish with something else, wouldn't I? A little lure, maybe use an egg instead, or maybe I'll go down and, and find some periwinkles. Now, I, I don't know if everybody knows what periwinkle is, but we'd take those, I, we'd find trout with their bellies full of periwinkles. They're good bait. Flip one of those under there. I would do everything I could to entice that fish to do what was in his nature to do. Now, every one of us have an old nature. And Satan is always dangling things out there to provoke that old nature of yours. Now, I, I, my mom, <laughs> you used to uh, subscribe to the Reader's Digest. Yes. And we'd get those little Reader's Digest, and in them they had those little jokes in them. My mom used to make me read those articles in there sometimes. They would read some of the jokes. I remember one of those jokes, probably the only joke I ever remember out of the Reader's Digest. But you'll get, it's, you'll get the implication here with this subject. It says, how are women and fishing a lot alike? It helps to wiggle the bait a little. Now, ladies, you want to entice a man to sin. Just act like the women of this world. Just dress immodestly. Just act like a whore out there. And you'll get men to look at you. Accentuate those parts of the body that will draw a man's eyes to them and cause him to lust after you. Wiggle that bait a little. And you'll cause men to fall. You know, the Bible says a lot about women and the immodest dress and the immodest activity of, of a woman but it also tells men that if you go after her, you're going into the ways of death. There's a lot of warning about men and women in the scriptures. This might end up being a three Sunday sermon instead of a two Sunday sermon. I'm taking my time with this because it's really, really important. Now, the doctrine of sin is not popular today in our churches. You brought that out this morning in the Sunday school teaching. Nobody wants to talk about sin these days. Why? Because they want to run off their congregation if they do. Nobody likes to hear about sin. And if you're going to teach about sin, then teach the sin that's in the Bible. And that will clean things up really good. It's not very popular. Why? Because we enjoy sin. Sin has pleasure in it. But you know what has more pleasure? Righteousness. Did, when we went through the Beatitudes, didn't say, blessed are they, happy are they. The pursuit of pleasure is not where the happiness is. The pursuit of righteousness is where happiness is. We get confused. But preachers don't want to upset the people about sin because that will make them discomfortable. Why, everybody likes to be comfortable in their life, don't they? You like being comfortable. Uh, a lot of times we choose the chairs that we choose because they're comfortable. We have chairs here. We don't have pews. We just meet here in the house. I get you a short chair that's shorter than those other chairs so that your feet touch the ground, right? <laughs> Thank you. We like to be comfortable. We don't want to upset people. We don't want to upset people about their sin, do we? We don't want to cause them any discomfort. We try to explain it away, or being simple creatures, think not of it as, as before holy God. We don't like to, 
You know, this is where the holiness of God and our sin are connected. When we realize how holy God is, we realize how sinful we are. And the more we realize how sinful we are, the more we realize how holy God is. But we dumb down to God and say, what would Jesus do? Which is a good question. It's a worthy question. But look at who Jesus is. Look at John in the book of the Revelation. When Christ is manifested and he falls down as a dead man. Do you see the familiarity of, oh, this is the man I knew on earth. Oh, this is the Jesus that I walked with for three and a half years. Do you see the familiarity between John and Jesus of, of, of the Revelation? No. Because John saw Christ as who he really was. He was manifested in the flesh, but we did not see his glory. John saw his glory. He fell down as a dead man. Oh, how we need to see the holiness of Christ. We try to sugarcoat sin and so it doesn't seem as bad as it really is. How many people are, are allowed to remain in a church who have been li who are living in, a, in an adulterous or a fornication type relationship? We don't say shame on you. We don't, in fact, we don't shame anybody in our churches these days. We used to do that. When somebody was caught in a sin and disciplined out of, their, out of the church, they were shamed because of it. You know, they go away mad nowadays. That <laughs> church don't love me. It's an unlovable church. <laughs> How foolish. We ought to be shamed by it. Sin ought to shame us. If not before the membership, if it's manifested, it certainly ought to be before God. We give an excuse with, oh, that's just the way God made me. God made you for the purpose of sin. Or, or we might hold the evolutionary thought that man is just an animal and our animalistic tendencies cannot be controlled. Why we do this, say we, you know, we, we, we gaze upon women and lust left of them because, because we're just animals. No, you're not. You were created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. To say that you're an animal means you believe in evolution. And then maybe you are just an animal. And you deny the word of God. Jesus is not dealing with the external actions as much as the internal condition of the heart. That is what he's dealing with in here. The internal condition of the heart. That which the Pharisees did not deal with, or want to deal with, or even believed was important. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You see, Samuel was coming to pick from among the sons of, uh, of, of Jesse a king that was going to replace Saul. And of all the sons, there were some that were tall and good looking and seemed like they would make good leaders for the country. And God warned Samuel, says, don't look on the outward appearance. Oh, they might be handsome, they might be very muscular, they might seem to be the right man for the job, they might appear to be leaders. You look on the outside and that's what the Pharisees were, were wanting to do. They wanted to make a good outward showing. This is what the Lord looketh where? Upon the heart. It is the heart of the issue. And he picked David, a shepherd among the sheep, because he had a heart that was right with the Lord. In Hebrews 12, 13 and 14, it says, And make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which men shall, no man shall see the Lord. You see, it's in the heart. It is the path of the feet. It is, and if you don't prepare 
It says, make and make straight paths for your feet. Go in a right direction. And if you get lamed, you're out, of, you're out of the way, aren't you? If sin comes and lames you up, be healed. Get back on that straight path. It is this very subject of external versus internal with that Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye in no case shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your heart. For in that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You see, these scribes and Pharisees, they were well esteemed and held up as being righteous, good men. Whitened sepulchers, but full of dead man's bones. You see, it was not an external problem that Jesus was dealing with. It was an internal problem. And it is an internal problem with all of us. We're going to see next week that this... Oh, he that looketh upon a woman have committed adultery with her in her heart already, we're seeing it's a heart issue. And every sin like unto adultery, whether it be theft or, um, or, or, or extortion or any of these others, guess where it comes from? It comes from the same problem that adultery comes from. It's an internal problem. It's a lust problem. And we're going to look at that next week as we dive further into this. We're going to see that the Pharisees forgot what the Tenth Commandment was, which was the whole point of the other nine. Father, I want to thank you because you have blessed us today. Your grace has come upon us. Father, help us to understand and to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of thy word that we might lean and fall upon Christ to deliver us, and that He is our sanctification, that He is our redemption, and that we have forgiveness of sin through Him. Might we yield to Him continuously in all points. May we not rely upon ourselves, but rather look to Christ. May we fill our minds and our hearts with Christ. Father, may we hide our word in, Your Word in our heart that we might sin against Thee. Father, glorify Thy Son in the Son's name.